Hello. Welcome and good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Lewis, and on behalf of Harvard University, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Bookstore, uh, we'd like to welcome, to welcome you to the latest installment in our Science Book Talk series. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce this event tonight with Joshua Wynn, who's presenting his latest book, The Little Book of Exoplanets. Uh, before we dive into his book, a few things to keep in mind tonight. Uh, so we do have one more event coming up this semester. Um, it'll be in the second week of December, and we'll release those details in the immediate future. Um, and for all things Harvard Science Book Talks, uh, subscribe to our Twitter, our newsletter, the YouTube channel, all of that good stuff. Um, so tonight's event will consist of roughly 40 to 45 minutes of Joshua telling us about his book. And then we'll have some time for questions. At that time, if you raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone to you. Um, and then lastly, and perhaps most pertinently, um, you know, there will be a reception and a book signing tonight after the event in the Cabot Library. Cheese cubes, all the good stuff. Uh -huh. um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Joshua Wynn. Joshua N. Wynn is a professor of astrophysical sciences at Princeton University and a co-investigator in NASA's ongoing transiting exoplanet survey satellite mission. That's a mouthful. Uh -huh. uh, his research aims to explore the properties of planets around other stars, understand how planets form and evolve, and make progress on the age-old question of whether there are planets capable of supporting life. In the Little Book of Exoplanets, Wynn offers us a brief and engaging introduction to the search for exoplanets and the cutting-edge science behind recent findings. In doing so, he chronicles the dawn of a new age of discovery, one that has rapidly transformed astronomy and our broader understanding of the universe. Scientists now know that many sun-like stars host their own system of planets, some of which may resemble our solar system and include planets similar to the Earth. But Wynn tells us the most remarkable discoveries so far have been those of planets with unexpected and decidedly unearth-like properties, which have upended what we've thought about the origins of planetary systems. Drawing on his own work and many others, he considers how the discovery of exoplanets and their faraway solar systems change our perspectives of the universe and our place in it. Um, so we have a lot to learn tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'm delighted to turn the stage over to Joshua Wynn. Thank you very much, Seth. That was a very thorough introduction. So I think we can just skip ahead to chapter two <laughs> at this point. But I, I really do uh, appreciate the introduction and the uh, hospitality of the Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Science Center, and also that uh, we have filled a room tonight with people who, on a random Thursday night, I think I should get away from the mic, have decided to spend their time learning about science. And I think that's terrific. And it also means I'm pretty sure we all have something in common besides being in this room together. There is a little bit of a, is anybody else hearing the, yeah. Maybe I should just lower this. Is it functioning at all now? <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Okay. If in the back, it's okay? Great. So as I was saying, I'm pretty sure we all have something in common, which is that at some point in your life, you have been outside on a clear, dark night like tonight. You have looked up at the stars. You learned that each one of those points of light is an entire star like the sun. And so you started wondering, does that star have any planets? Are they, are they anything like the Earth? Are there any creatures out there looking back at me wondering the same thing? People have been asking these questions for centuries. But it's only been the last few decades that they have changed from philosophical speculations into actual research programs. And this is now one of the most exciting and rapidly advancing areas of astronomy. It's called exoplanetary science. And that is because an exoplanet is a planet, but it doesn't orbit the sun. It orbits some distant star elsewhere in the galaxy. So tonight, 
my goal is to take you to the frontier of this field, to, to tell you what do we know and how do we know it. Another fun thing about being in this field is that there was a long time before the discovery of exoplanets that we were all imagining exoplanets. And that's in part thanks to science fiction. And the Star Wars movies were, were especially good for this. You know, among the Star Wars worlds that, that we enjoyed were Mustafar. This is the planet covered by oceans of lava where Anakin and Ben Kenobi had their climactic lightsaber duel. And there was Tatooine, Luke Skywalker's home planet, where he could gaze longingly at the horizon and watch two suns setting. So another message I have tonight is that the boundary between science and science fiction is, is moving. It's moving fast. And in fact, we know of two real exoplanets that share the key characteristics of these fictional worlds that made them so captivating. So, before we get carried away, though, with all of these strange new worlds, let's remind ourselves about normal planets, familiar planets, the planets in the solar system. So these are the planets in the solar system. They kind of come in, uh, in, in pairs. So we have these two little guys, Mercury and Mars. Uh, we have Earth and Venus. And all of these are the so-called terrestrial planets. They're small and they're solid. They're made of rock and metal. Then we have two giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and they are mostly made of gas. They're made of hydrogen and helium. And then we have a pair of kind of in-between planets that are mostly uh, solid materials, rock and metal, but they also have a substantial amount of hydrogen and helium. <coughs> now, where do we put these planets? Let's look at a map of the solar system from above. And I want to point out three important patterns that you can see both from the previous pictures as well as from this map. The first one is that the orbits of the planets are nearly circular. Now when you study physics, you learn that orbits don't have to be circular. In fact, orbits in general are ellipses. And they can range from being very circular to being highly elongated ovals. So why are the actual orbits so close to being circular? It seems to be telling us something about the formation of the solar system. Likewise, if we were to view the solar system from the side, we find this other pattern, which is that the orbits are nearly aligned with each other. They all move in the common plane shared by these planets. And that, too, is not a foregone conclusion. There's no law of physics that says the orbits have to be aligned. So the fact that they actually are also seems significant. And then finally, there's a pattern related to what the planets are made of. The rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, are all close to the sun. In fact, very close to the sun. You can barely see them on this slide. Whereas the gas giants, the ones with lots of hydrogen and helium, are much farther away from the sun. That, too, doesn't seem random. It seems to call for some kind of explanation. And the explanation that developed over the centuries, when these facts uh, became clearer and clearer, runs like this. This is the modern version of planet formation theory. The idea is, um, first of all, stars and planets have to be born. They did not just spring into existence with the Big Bang. And the way we think they were born is, oh, by the way, I forgot my joke. Okay, So Pluto, <laughs> Pluto obeys none of these patterns. It is a rocky planet, it is far from the sun, it's on an elliptical and misaligned orbit. But we're scientists, we know what to do about this. We simply redefine the word planet so that Pluto is no longer a planet <laughs> and there are no exceptions to this rule. Okay, now, seriously, the, the story with Pluto is a very interesting one, uh, but that's another talk. Okay. So, like I said, the theory of planet formation. The idea is that when we look around the galaxy, in addition to seeing stars, we see these huge irregular clouds of hydrogen and helium, mostly, but with a sprinkling of heavier elements, of grains of dust, flecks of ice mixed in. And the idea is that stars and planets come from the gravitational collapse of these clouds. Gravity is a force that attracts everything to everything else. 
So left to its own devices, this cloud would eventually start contracting under its own gravity. But it doesn't just collapse to a single point. Instead, any initially slight rotation of this cloud, just by chance, gets amplified as the cloud shrinks. This is from a principle called the conservation of angular momentum. Same reason that the ice skater speeds up when she pulls her arms in. And so as it collapses, it doesn't form a point. Instead, it forms a disk, a spinning vortex. And the material that actually makes it down to the center, that's what becomes the star. But this process, this spiraling in, is a very prolonged process. It takes millions of years. And in this theory, that's what gives the opportunity for planets to form. These little bits of dust and ice collide with each other in this disk to form little pebbles. And they collide with each other to form rocks and boulders and become larger and larger. And eventually, some of them work their way up to such a size that their own gravity is sufficient to start accreting the surrounding hydrogen and helium gas. So the planets form within this so-called protoplanetary disk. <coughs> now, this is a great story, and it fits the facts. It explains those three patterns that I mentioned a moment ago. Why are the orbits circular? Because the disk was circular. There is a principle of physics that says if you let a disk swirl around like this and let the particles all collide, it will become circular. So if the planets formed within this disk, naturally their orbits will start out as circles. Why are the orbits aligned? The disk was flat. And the third pattern, why are the gas giants the ones that are so far from the sun? That one actually has a much more complicated answer that took a lot longer to develop. But the idea is that far away from the sun, there was more solid material in the disk, basically because it was colder. The farther away you get from the sun, the colder it is. And so common molecules like water and ammonia exist as ices rather than as vapors. And that gives you a lot more solid material to pack onto this growing planet. It's like packing a snowball, but you have lots more snow when you get far enough away from the sun. And so that allows planets to grow to larger sizes, larger masses, far from the sun. And that's what allows them to reach this critical mass, at which point they can become gas giants. So like I said, it's a great story. It fits all the facts. But we should be skeptical, because the theory was invented to fit the facts. And it was invented before we had any knowledge of planets elsewhere in the galaxy. And the important thing is that in this theory, this theory doesn't invoke any kind of rare coincidental events. It makes planet formation seem like an inevitable outcome of these laws of nature, of gravitational collapse, the conservation of angular momentum. So it predicts that when we finally would find exoplanets, those systems would obey these same three patterns. OK, so the test of the theory is to find those systems. And that's another reason why exoplanetary science is of such interest today, is to test and modify this theory of planet formation. So how do we do it? How do we find exoplanets? Why was it so difficult to do it? We need to understand the technological challenge that's involved. So what if I asked you to find an exoplanet? I'll give you as much money as you need. What are you going to do? How are you going to find one? Well, the first thing you might think of is to use that money to buy a telescope, maybe a really good telescope, and then point at some nearby star and try to zoom in as much as you can, hoping that, say, pointing at this star, that you would see the star. And if the telescope were really good, then maybe you would be able to see the planets going around this star as faint points of light in the same neighborhood as that star. The problem is, when you actually buy the telescope and point at this star and zoom in, you, you do not see this. You see this. Okay? <laughs> the glare from the star completely overpowers any much fainter light from the planets that orbit it. If you were looking at the solar system with a telescope from 100 light years away, the Earth would be 10 billion times fainter than the sun. So it's a very difficult problem. You need to make an image 
capable of achieving that kind of contrast. Furthermore, this is a real image, and this star is so far away that with a kind of perfect camera, it should appear as a single pixel in this image, but it doesn't. And that's because the laws of optics prevent us from focusing the light as tightly as we might wish. It's a problem called diffraction. So even though it's so far away, it should look like a point, starlight spills all over our detector, creating this glare. So this, this very direct method of pointing the telescope and looking for the little dots is, for the moment, borderline impossible. Okay. And I, I, I snuck in the word borderline there because it has worked in a few cases, and I'll come back to, to those cases when it has worked. But most of our knowledge about exoplanets does not come from, from this direct imaging method. We know of about uh, 5,500 exoplanets, and the great majority of them come from sneakier methods, more indirect methods. We have to be a little more clever and use our knowledge of physics and our ability to measure starlight very precisely to detect these exoplanets. Okay, so let me, I want to tell you about two such methods. The first method is based on the fact that when we teach our students that the planets go around the sun, that's a little white lie. It's not exactly correct. Okay, what really is happening is that the planets and the star are both orbiting around the center of mass of the system, the sort of average position of all of the atoms in the system. Now, the star is much more massive than the planet, and so the center of mass is close to the center of the star, but it is not at the center of the star. So the star is moving as well, and that is what gives us our way in because we have gotten very good at measuring the motions of stars. And the trick there is another principle of physics called the Doppler effect. Now you have probably heard of the Doppler effect, just to remind you and to wake up anybody who might have fallen asleep. This is the Doppler effect. You get the Doppler effect whenever you have a source of waves that is moving relative to the observer. So in the case of a car, those waves are sound waves. So if the car were not moving, the sound waves would be emanating in these circles, where each of these circles represents a little bit of extra air pressure. That's what a sound wave is that is moving out from the car. But if we allow the car to move, now in the forward direction, it is catching up with its own previously emitted waves. And so if you are over here, those waves arrive with a shorter wavelength. And for sound, shorter wavelength means higher pitch. But if you are on this side, now the car is racing away from its own previously emitted waves. The wavelength you observe is longer. That means lower pitch. Okay, that's the Doppler effect. And it's true for any kind of wave. And light is a sort of wave. So if a star is moving, the same thing should happen to the wavelength of light emitted by that star. It's just that for light, a shorter wavelength means bluer, and a longer wavelength means redder. So we get these, if we observe from this direction, the star looks slightly bluer than it usually does, and if we're in this direction, it looks slightly redder. Now, we never notice this in everyday life. Right? If there is a car driving towards you at night with its headlights on, you don't see the headlights looking slightly bluer than usual. And that's because the size of this effect, the fractional change in wavelength, is the speed of the object divided by the speed of the waves. And the speed of light is very high. So it is a minuscule effect in everyday life. But like I said, our job as astronomers is to measure the properties of starlight as precisely as we can. And we've gotten quite good at that. And this was the first technique that really worked in a large-scale way to detect exoplanets, the Doppler method. Okay, so now I want to, again, I'm going to bring you to the frontier. I want to show you some of the data that is used to support these claims of detections of exoplanets. So the one I've chosen, oh, again, I forgot to, one thing I wanted to mention. What makes this easier for us is a remarkable property of starlight, which is that if you use a prism, say, to uh, separate sunlight into a continuous rainbow, you see this beautiful rainbow, 
But in addition, you see these dark lines at very specific wavelengths. There are specific colors that appear to be missing from the spectrum of a star like the sun. Now, the reason for that is very interesting. It's because of the particular atoms and ions in the atmosphere of the sun. Each atom has its favorite wavelengths, its favorite colors that it absorbs much more than, than any other. So sodium, for example, absorbs this, this orange-yellow shade here. And magnesium is fond of this kind of green shade here between green and blue. And that's, that's very interesting. That is how we learn about what the sun and other stars are made of. But from the point of view of detecting exoplanets, they're just convenient. There are these nice, sharp features, like a, like a barcode. And we can track those lines very precisely, looking for any motion due to the Doppler shift. So this is, this is what we cannot see. This is what's happening. And we're 100 light years away. But what we can see is that those absorption lines in the spectra are jiggling back and forth by very small amounts. They're exaggerated here in this animation. And then we can make a chart of the speed of the star away from us or towards us over time. And if the star is moving in a little circle, then we'll get this back and forth motion as the star is moving alternately towards and away from us. Okay, so that's the concept of the Doppler method. Now, let me show you some data. The star I have chosen is uh, in this image. This is the southern sky. Maybe some of you have had the treat of going to the southern hemisphere on a, on a clear, dark night like this. This is the famous Southern Cross. The constellation of Centaurus kind of bends around it like this. And does anybody know what this object is here? Pointers? It is, this is, well, they're pointers. They point towards the, uh, the, you can use them to look for the South Pole. The star itself is called Alpha Centauri. It pops up in science fiction all the time because it is said to be the nearest star to our Earth. Okay. That's not quite right. First of all, it's two stars. It's a pair of stars. Okay. And second of all, there actually is a, a star that is slightly closer than Alpha Centauri. You cannot see it, though, with the naked eye. It is too faint. It's a tiny little red star called Proxima Centauri. And you need, at the very least, a really good pair of binoculars to spot it. And it is just a hair closer to us than the two stars of Alpha Centauri. Anyways, I think it was in 2016, 2017, a group of astronomers announced they had detected a planet around this very nearest neighbor to our own star. So it was very exciting. Furthermore, what made it even more exciting is that the planet orbits in the so-called habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. What is the habitable zone? It is defined as the range of distances from a star where the heat from the starlight would be sufficient to melt ice, that is, to allow for water to exist as a liquid, but not so hot that it would vaporize. So it's the range of distances where, you could, where if you have an Earth-like planet, you might have liquid water oceans. Now, that's nice if you want to go for a swim, but why do we call that habitable? It is because, on the Earth at least, every known form of life seems to require liquid water, at least at some point in its life cycle. And there are also a lot of people who think that life got started on the Earth in the oceans. And so that seems like an important clue. And so if we're going to search exoplanets for signs of life and we need to prioritize, it does make sense to pick the planets where you might be able to go for a swim that are in the habitable zone of their stars. So this was tremendously exciting. Not only did they find a planet right next door, but it is a potentially habitable planet, not too much more massive than the Earth. If you were paying attention when this discovery was announced, and it was pretty big news at the time, the news article you read was probably accompanied by this image from the surface of this new planet. <laughs> you can see this is Proxima Centauri. You see the two stars here. That's Alpha Centauri, a pair of stars. There are these mountains, these cliffs. There's even kind of a mist rising from the, from the valley here. Of course, this is complete fantasy. We have no idea what it might look like on the surface of this planet. Everything we know about this planet actually comes from this chart. Okay? When I think about an exoplanet, I usually am not thinking about some evocative scene. I am thinking about a chart like this one. Okay? <laughs> what does it show? It shows what we can measure. It shows the speed of the star, either away from us or towards us, as a function of time, in this case in days. 
And these are two different seasons when the star was observed. And the pattern doesn't exactly leap off of the page, but you can see there's a general tendency for the data points to bounce around like that. That's because the star is moving in response to the gravity from this orbiting planet. So that is the evidence. This is, this is the reality, and the previous slide is what happens when you take this chart and give it to one of our friends, the artists. <laughs> okay. So this is another very famous uh, chart. This was kind of what kicked off the exoplanet revolution in 1995. It was a discovery, a Doppler discovery, made for a star called 51 Pegasi, which is very much like the sun. So again, we see this, this oscillatory motion. That's because the star is moving around the center of mass of a planetary system. Now, the amplitude of this signal, the fact that it's 70 meters per second, that tells us something about the mass of the planet. And when you work out the numbers, this comes out to be comparable to Jupiter. So presumably, this is a gas giant planet, similar to Saturn or Jupiter. But what was really shocking was the, this axis, the time axis. The time it takes for the signal to repeat is only four days. That means the planet goes all the way around its orbit every four days. The so-called orbital period is four days. This planet is right next to the star. If the sun had a planet just like 51 Pegasi, where would we put it on this map? Well, we couldn't. Right? We need to zoom way in here in order to see where it would be. So let's do that. Let's zoom into the inner part of the solar system. So now we have Earth, Venus, <coughs> Mercury. Here's the sun. And this is where 51 Pegasi B, the planet, would be if we had one of those. So the reason this was so shocking is that it's very unlike the solar system, and it completely contradicts that complicated story I was telling you about the formation of the solar system, how the gas giants can only form far away from the star where it's cold and there's more material. Apparently, that theory is wrong, or at least incomplete. So that's, again, this was one of the very first exoplanet discoveries, and it already contradicted our pre-exoplanet theory of planet formation. OK. Now, what is going on here? This is another sun-like star. It goes by the name HD 80606. Okay. There's too many of these to give cute, memorable names to them, so they're often just catalog numbers at this point. What we are again seeing is speed versus time, but this one doesn't look like the gentle wavy pattern we saw before. The star was moving away from us at 600 meters per second, then it started slowing down and it came to a stop and started moving towards us. But then on this day, it jammed on the accelerator and jerked up and started moving more than 600 meters per second away from us. Why is it doing that? What is going on here? Is this a planet? Is this something else? Does anybody have an idea? It is not even close to being a circular orbit. It's highly elliptical. And the star is at one end of that orbit. So here goes the planet. And because the force of gravity is stronger when the two bodies are close together, that causes the planet to move faster when it is near the star, causing this burst of acceleration. And the star, you can't see it in this, in this movie, but the star is doing the same thing in reverse because they're both moving around the center of mass. That's what causes this big burst in acceleration here. It's the close passage of the, of the planet to the star. So that's another thing we learned very early. The orbits do not have to be circular. Now, I've chosen one of the most extreme examples to make this point, but there are a wide range of shapes for these exoplanet orbits for reasons that are still debated. Okay, That's enough about the Doppler method. The next method I want to describe to you, and in fact the most prolific method we have right now, is based on eclipses. So who here has seen a total solar eclipse? All right, this is quite an audience, right? That's actually kind of unusual. I'm glad. Those of you who haven't, you do have another chance in April. I forget the date. It might be April 6th or April 8th. 8th, OK. There is an unusually convenient total solar eclipse and the shadow path runs right across the US. Anyways, that's a total solar eclipse. They're spectacular, unmissable. If you're, if you're in the shadow path, it's very obvious that something special is happening. Okay. But there are other types of eclipses, too, that are, that are more subtle. Okay. 
This is a movie that was made in 2012 over the course of about six hours. This little dot here, that's Venus making one of its very rare passages directly across the face of the sun, so-called transit of Venus. Now this is nothing, uh, you would not have noticed anything was going on if you were paying attention on this day. You have to be told that this is happening and use special equipment to see it going across uh, the surface of the, of the face of the sun. So it is a very, very subtle type of event. Nevertheless, the same kind of thing must also happen for exoplanets occasionally, these rare types of events. So even if the sun were so far away that it appeared as a single point of light in the sky, we might be able to tell what's going on by monitoring the brightness of the sun and seeing that something is going in front of it and causing it to be slightly fainter every time its orbit brings it around. So that is the second way we have of detecting exoplanets, is to look for these miniature eclipses or transits of exoplanets. Remember I said there are about 5,500 known exoplanets. About 4,500 of them come from this method. This turns out to be the most prolific method we have, and it is also, at the moment, the only method that is capable of detecting a planet as small as the Earth. So this is very much the here and now of exoplanetary science, is this transit method. And now again, I want to show you some real data um, to understand what we can measure, what we can conclude, and what remains as speculation. Okay. So here is some data for a star called Kepler-22. Now we don't have speed versus time. We have brightness versus time. And it's defined so that 1 is the normal, ordinary brightness of the star. And time is measured in days over the course of about 500 days. And it doesn't look very interesting. It right? doesn't look like this star varied in brightness at all. But that's because we're not looking hard enough. With a telescope in space above the Earth's atmosphere, we can achieve very precise brightness measurements. So let's zoom in now. Let's just focus on going very close to brightness of 1 here. So I'm going to change the vertical axis. So now it ranges from 0.999 to 1.005. Now you can see, yeah, the star is basically constant in brightness, but there were these two dips here. So this, the, the, the brightness of the star changed in the fourth decimal place here. Those are transits of an exoplanet orbiting this star. I'm not showing the full data set, but it keeps happening at regular intervals. So this is the evidence for a planet around Kepler-22. What do we get to learn? Well, we can measure how much light it is blocking, in this case, 0.05%. And we know what kind of a star it is, so we know the size of the star. That lets us calculate the size of the planet. And in this case, it's no more than about twice the size of the Earth. So this is probably a, more like a rocky planet than a gas giant. And the other thing we can measure is the time between these events, which in this case is about 290 days. That's the orbital period of this planet. And it's not too different from our orbital period of 365 days. In fact, that means that this planet is also located in the so-called habitable zone of Kepler-22. Its orbit is the right <coughs> size and takes the right amount of time to go around for liquid water to exist on the surface of this potentially Earth-like planet. Okay, so we give these two numbers to our space artist friends. <laughs> and there's the press release. Right? <laughs> this is what you see in the newspapers and the magazines. You know, these clouds, the continents, you know, it's kind of greenish. Maybe there are plants or something like that. Again, at, at the moment, this is fantasy. We have two numbers that characterize our entire knowledge about this planet. Okay, so we have learned a lot. And, you know, even if you only have two numbers per planet, if you have thousands of planets, like now you're starting to talk about real data, and you might be able to see patterns and trends and learn from the entire collection. But for an individual planet, we often have very limited information. Here's another one. This one's called Kepler-11. And again, we have brightness versus time, and we can measure these changes in the fourth decimal place. But this one looks different. There are a lot of dips, but they don't look periodic. They seem to be occurring erratically. And in fact, some of them go deeper than others. So 
What is going on here? What is the explanation in this case? Multiple Very good. There are at least six planets all going around, all transiting this star on their own regular schedules. So what we were seeing there is just a small part of a large data set consisting of six periodic signals all concatenated together. Okay. So there are a lot of these. These, 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 these kinds of miniature systems. I didn't, I didn't mention it yet, but what is also remarkable is the orbits of all these planets are very small. They would all fit into what would be Venus's orbit around that same star. In fact, five of them would fit inside of Mercury's orbit around the sun. So this is a teeny tiny little solar system, a sort of mini planetary system. And that's interesting. Those had not been predicted by anybody's theory of planet formation. And what's even more interesting is they're very common. If you pick a random star like the sun, there's at least one chance in three that it has one of these. So we seem to have discovered a whole new mode of planet formation that had not been anticipated by scientists, and to my knowledge, not even by science fiction authors. Which is kind of surprising, right? Because the aliens on these planets could travel between the planets much more easily than we can in our solar system. So this would be a very good setting for a science fiction story about a multi-planet system. Here's another one. This is one of my favorites. It's called Kepler 78. And we have brightness against time. And we see these dips here. And in this case, the dips go down uh, you know, by 0. .0002. And if you work out the numbers, this means that this planet is comparable in size to the Earth. So it is presumably a rocky planet like the Earth or Venus or something like that. The really interesting thing about Kepler 78 is the time axis. So We've already gotten used to planets that take only a few days to go around. This one only takes eight hours to go around. So you get a good night's sleep, and you know, the planet has gone all the way around in those same eight hours. So this planet is almost literally as close as it is possible to be to the star without being destroyed, either by the heat or by the gravitational forces that would pull the planet apart. Furthermore, you've probably noticed by now, because I know you are a very observant audience at this point, there's a second dip here. And that is real. That is a statistically significant dip in brightness in between these two transits. So what's, what's going on there? Well, here's what we have to imagine. Okay? The planet goes in front of the star, and that explains these, these dips here. Okay? That's the transit of the planet. But then what happens afterwards? The side of the planet facing the star is so hot that it is glowing. And so we start to see the hot, glowing day side of the planet, and then we lose it. And when we lose sight of it, the total brightness that we measure from the system goes down a little bit. That's the second dip here. So the reason this is interesting is now we have three numbers. Okay, We can measure the size of the planet. We can measure how long it takes to go around. And the size of this dip tells us the temperature of the planet's surface based on how hot it must be to be glowing by the observed amount. And it's so close to this star, it comes out to be thousands of degrees, well above the melting point of all the common rocks and minerals on the Earth. You, know, you see where I'm going with this. We hand these three numbers to our space artists. <laughs> this is what the planet looks like. Okay? These, are, these are the so-called lava worlds. We know of about 100 of these now that are so close to their stars that it is very reasonable to conclude that at least the side of the planet facing the star is molten and is covered with a planet-wide ocean of, of lava. So this is our Mustafar-type planet. Now, here's another one. This is Kepler 1647, so we're jumping over a lot of objects here. Here it looks kind of similar to the ones we've, we've seen before, but not quite. Because look, these dips go down all the way. This one goes down to 0.8. So something is blocking 20% of the light of this star. That's way too big to be a planet. And furthermore, they seem to alternate. Right? They, you, the, the depths here are different. So this, these can't be planets. And at the same time, though, if you zoom way in here, that's what this lower chart is. We're just zooming in on a narrow range of brightness ranges here, we see that there is a tiny dip here that looks more like a planetary dip. It's only 0.2%. So what's the story here? What's going on here is, is really wonderful. We have a pair of stars. 
a binary star. And we are, we are looking at it from the side. So we see the red star go in front of the yellow star. That explains one of these dips. We see the yellow star go in front of the red star. That explains another one of these dips. And then there is a planet whose orbit is looping around both stars at the same time. And every time that planet completes an orbit, it transits the yellow star, it transits the red star, and we can see all of that in our data set. And it all fits perfectly with a model involving these three bodies rather than just one star at the center. So this is a so-called circumbinary planet. Of course, the other name for them are Tatooine planets, right? <laughs> there really are planets where you could enjoy a double sunset. In fact, they don't even seem to be that rare. They are harder for us to detect because the signals are more complicated. But as it, it, apparently, if you are far enough away from a binary, first of all, binary stars are very common. And if you're far enough away from a binary star that an orbit would be stable there, you're just as likely to find a planet as if you had looked at a single star like the sun. So they're very common. OK. Now, a lot of these planets I've been showing you have number, names like Kepler-22, Kepler blah, blah, blah. That's because of this space telescope, the Kepler Space Telescope, which was launched by NASA in 2009. Had a good run until 2018. It's a telescope whose opening uh, diameter here is about a meter. And unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a sort of general purpose telescope, the Kepler Space Telescope was very single purpose. It was obsessive. All it did was measure the brightnesses of hundreds of thousands of stars as precisely and as continuously as possible. And it, and it discovered thousands of these transiting exoplanets. So that's, this was a huge leap in our understanding of exoplanets, thanks to this, this very important NASA mission. But it did come to an end in 2018. Fortunately, uh, we have another one. So with the current engine of planet discovery is called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It was launched in 2018, and it has four telescopes instead of just one. And each of them has a much wider field of view than the Kepler telescope. So we can examine much larger patches of the sky. So with TESS, we are ultimately trying to survey the entire sky, all of the brightest, nearest stars in our neighborhood of the galaxy, looking for these transiting exoplanets. And this, this has gotten a later start than Kepler. It's just getting going. But it has already found several hundred planets. In fact, I think the current rate of discoveries is, is about three or four per week are coming out of this mission. And in addition, it has found thousands of what we call planet candidates, that is, uh, brightness records that show dips, but we're not quite sure yet whether they are planets or not. So this is, uh, again, our main source of new planets at the moment in this field. Okay. So all of that is great, but as I've tried to emphasize, our knowledge of individual planets is very limited. We can learn the size, we can learn the mass, we might be able to learn the temperature if it's really close to the star, but that leaves us with many questions that we wish we knew the answers to. For example, if we find a planet that has roughly the same orbit and size as the Earth, how do we know that this is what it looks like and that it's not more like Venus, which has roughly the same size as the Earth and is only a little bit closer? The key is the, the reason why Venus and Earth are so different, why Venus is so much hotter than the Earth, it's not it's not necessarily because it's closer to the sun. That's part of the reason. But the main reason is the atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, and it is 100 times as massive as the Earth's atmosphere. So if we really want to understand a planet, we need to know something about its atmosphere. But how can we possibly do that, given these, these somewhat primitive methods we have for gaining knowledge about these exoplanets? The key is spectroscopy, as I mentioned before. Each atom, each ion, each molecule has its favorite wavelengths of light that it absorbs more than any other. So that, that allows us uh, to use a trick based on transits. Okay, so planet here is transiting the star. It's blocking a certain part of the, of the starlight. But it has an atmosphere. And the atmosphere, at some height, becomes partially transparent. So some of the starlight filters through that translucent part of the atmosphere before it makes its journey 
all the way to our telescopes. Now let's say there's some carbon dioxide in that atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, we know, happens to absorb very strongly light with a wavelength of 4.3 micrometers. So if we tune our observations to that wavelength, if we put on special glasses that only admit light with 4.3 micrometer wavelengths, this would look different. The carbon dioxide would be absorbing like crazy, and so the planet, the atmosphere would look dark. It would look black. And the planet would appear to be blocking more light at that wavelength than at surrounding wavelengths. That's the game. You perform these observations at multiple wavelengths, and you see at which ones does the planet block more light. Okay. So the telescope we have now that is the best at this kind of experiment is the famous James Webb Space Telescope. This is a very general purpose space telescope that was launched in 2021. It's revolutionizing lots of fields of astrophysics, including this one. This transit spectroscopy is one of the big enterprises that people are, 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 con are conducting with Webb. I think something like a fifth or a sixth of the telescope time is going to exoplanet investigations like transit spectroscopy. So let me show you some real Webb data. Okay. By now, we've kind of gotten used to this. We're looking at brightness against time. This is over the course of six hours. And so we're zooming in on one of these transits. Here goes the planet crossing the face of the star, coming back out. This is as observed at a certain wavelength. If we look again at 4.3 micrometers, and Webb can collect these data simultaneously, lots of wavelengths at the same time, now we see that the star gets a little bit fainter. And that extra absorption here is indeed from carbon dioxide. Now this was a giant planet. This is a Jupiter-sized planet. I can tell because it's blocking 2% of the star's light, which, is, which is the, corresponds to the size of Jupiter. So we have detected carbon dioxide, among other gases, in the atmosphere of this giant planet. At the moment, this works really well, but we can only really do it well for giant planets. If you were to do the same thing but for an Earth-like planet, the signals would be much smaller, and even the Webb telescope would struggle to be able to detect gases in the atmosphere of such a small planet. Nevertheless, we really want to do that. Okay, there's a big push to try to adapt this technology and this type of observation to smaller and smaller, more and more Earth-like planets. Why is that? Because it might give us a way to get a hint about whether these planets are actually inhabited. It's all very well to be in the habitable zone, but is there anybody living there? Okay. How would that work? Well, uh, yeah, let me show you this first. So this is another way of presenting the data. Here we have the light that's being blocked by that particular giant planet as a function of the wavelength. And we see that most of the time it's blocking 2.2, 2.1% of the starlight. But at this particular wavelength, it goes the, the, the more light is being blocked from absorption by carbon dioxide. If we were 100 light years away from the solar system, trying to perform these same investigations on Venus and Earth and Mars, what we would see is all three of these planets have carbon dioxide. But only Earth has the signature associated with oxygen, or in this case with ozone, O3, one of the byproducts of having oxygen in our atmosphere. And that's interesting because the only reason we have so much oxygen in our atmosphere is because the plants and the bacteria and the algae keep putting it there. Otherwise, oxygen is very reactive, and on geological timescales, it would all disappear from the atmosphere. So the thinking goes, if we could do this for exoplanets, and we see that there's an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, and we see oxygen in its atmosphere, or some other combination of gases that seems plausibly related to life, well, that might kickstart the currently hypothetical field of astrobiology. So that's eventually where we want to head in this field. Now, that's all very well, but what about direct imaging? Remember I said before, that it's borderline impossible. But it would be really nice if we could get an image and actually see an Earth-like planet. Okay, so the field is also heading in that direction. But it's very difficult because, like I said, the problem of the glare of the star is kind of overwhelming. Nevertheless, I have very clever colleagues who are very good at building fancy cameras. And I, I won't try to explain what's going on here, but this is a camera called a coronagraph. The, the gist of it is that you insert some 
strategically placed obstacles in the path of the light that prevent the starlight from hitting your detector, but allow light from a nearby planet to, to get through. So if you do this, and you do an awful lot of digital signal processing, then you might have a hope of finding planets. And it has worked in a few dozen cases. And I want to show you the very best case. Okay? It's this one. This is a star called HR8799. The star is here, but the light from the star has been blotted out by the coronagraph. Not perfectly, so some of the starlight is spilling out along the rim here. But in addition, you see this, and that, and that, and that. And those are planets. Now, how do we know? Well, this, is, this was discovered about 10 years ago. And so at this point, we can make a movie and actually just watch the planets go around the star, obeying the laws of physics as we know them. So this is the greatest success so far of this direct imaging method. How far away is this star? Um, several hundred light years, I would guess. I don't happen to remember. Why did it work in this special case? It's because these planets are very far away from their star. So this is the size of what would be Neptune's orbit around that star. These are very distant planets. They're also very massive, much more massive even than Jupiter. All of those things make them easier to spot. They, they make these planets brighter and easier to separate from the starlight. So this is currently, we are far from the goal of being able to do this for Earth-like planets. Nevertheless, our astronomical community has collectively decided that that is the astro that is NASA's and, NS and the National Science Foundation's highest goal for the next few decades, is to build a space telescope that is capable of doing this, but for systems like the solar system. Uh, right now, it is just a kind of a daydream, or maybe a little more uh, specific than a daydream. It's called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. It might be something like a souped-up version of the Webb Space Telescope. And it might be launched or deployed by around uh, 2040. Okay, so it is not, we just launched the Webb telescope. This would not be the next space telescope. That one's called the Roman space telescope. This would be the one after that. Okay, so we're two space telescopes away from being able to do this. So I guess the, the, the message is that we all need to take very good care of ourselves so that we can <laughs> enjoy this moment in 2040 when we might be able to see an image like this simulated image with this Habitable Worlds Observatory where you see, you see Jupiter very easily, you can see Venus over here, and you would get to see the Earth as a pale blue dot in the language of, of Carl Sagan. So that's something to look forward to, um, and that is, the, that is where we are headed in this field. So thank you for your attention tonight. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. So would, would you like to send the microphone around, people? OK. Yeah, there's two over here. Hi. Um, doesn't the, um, the transit method depend on the fact that the ecliptic of the solar system is, intersects the Earth? It does, yes. So I, I, I've been saying how wonderful the transit method is, but it does have this really serious problem that I didn't mention. Most planets do not transit, ever. Their orbits have to be aligned so that the plane of the orbit is right along our line of sight in order for them ever to go right in front of the star. So for every Earth-like planet we see transiting, we can be pretty sure there are several hundred that are just oriented the wrong way. So it's great when it works, gives us a lot of information, but it, is, it misses most of the planets in the galaxy. Um. One exotic thing in science fiction is a binary star with a planet doing a figure eight. Ah. Is that even possible, meaning stable enough to so we might see it? And right. if so, what would the do we know what it would look like on this? Right. Graph? So mathematically, you can construct a model of two stars orbiting each other, and there is an orbit that would thread between the stars like a figure eight. Okay. So the short answer to your question is we have not found any such planets. You would have told us. Nor would we really, uh, if, I mean, it's always hard. To, uh, I, I always dislike saying, we will never see that, OK? But it's pretty unlikely, because such orbits are generally very unstable. 
So mathematically, yes, you can find such an orbit, but if you push the planet just a little bit, it would fall onto one or the other of the two stars. Saturn's rings are unstable also, aren't they? Are we lucky to see them at all? It's true. Uh, yeah, a lot is unknown actually about Saturn's rings, but they are thought to be very temporary, meaning only a few million years. Okay, so watch them while you can. Yeah. <laughs> Have you, uh, have any planets been identified by more than one approach? Indeed, yes. So the transit and the Doppler methods work very well together. When you discover a transiting planet, you can learn the physical size of the planet, the diameter. But to get the mass, you then also need the Doppler method. So that's usually the first thing you do after finding a transiting planet, is pursue that same star with the Doppler method. That's where we have the most crossover. There are actually several other methods I haven't even described. But those two are the ones that, that partner best. Thank you very much for a marvelous talk. Now, there's an avalanche of data on exoplanets coming out of the, the web because it seems like every other week there's a new exciting paper on the That's archive, right. for example. So what, from your perspective as a strong man of exoplanets, What's the most exciting result in the, in the exoplanet field that's come out of Kepler, uh, I mean, out of, the web tel out of the web telescope to date? Um, that's, a that's a good question. A lot of the blockbuster papers have been about the atmospheres of giant planets, detecting this molecule or that molecule, that sort of thing. Off the top of my head, my favorite result is actually about direct imaging. The web telescope. Uh, was used to look at some nearby clusters of young stars, groupings of stars that formed like only 10 million years ago. And in addition to seeing all the stars, they found very faint sources of light that appear to be planet mass objects that don't belong to any star, just freely floating in the cluster. So maybe they were ejected from planetary systems by gravitational encounters between planets, or maybe they formed independently of any star. So I find that intriguing just because it's so unexpected. Um, how does the Doppler shift method work with like an inclined system? If, because depending on the inclination relative to us, the shift in like re recessional velocity will be greater or less. I like the way you think. Yes, it's another subtlety I didn't explain, another limitation of the Doppler method, which is that the Doppler effect is only sensitive to motion towards or away from you, not sideways motion. So that means just from the amplitude of the Doppler signal, we cannot tell if it is a low mass planet on an edge on orbit like this, or a much more massive planet, but its orbit is tilted nearly perpendicular to our line of sight. And so the, toward, the back and forth motion is very small. Most of the motion is sideways. So with the Doppler method, we only measure the planet's minimum possible mass. That said, if you have both the Doppler and a transit signal, then you, this ambiguity goes away, and you can measure the mass directly. Uh, thank you for your talk, and I have a quite specific question sure. about the like the double star system. So, like uh, the two stars are two light resources. So, how can you see the like the transit of like one light resources blocking another light resources? Right. If I understand your question right, you are correct that we don't actually see the two stars as separate points in the image. All we are measuring is the total light from both stars. And when one star goes in front of the other one, that causes the total light to go down. And we can see that. And when the planet goes in front of one of the two stars, the light goes down a tiny little bit. Not as much as if we were just looking at a single star in the planet. So the constant light from the other star makes the signal smaller. But nevertheless, we can account for that and still calculate the size of the planet. Did I understand your question right? Uh, like. Yeah. Okay. Partially, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, thank you for your answer. So like my question is actually like uh, when the star is blocking another star, yeah. the 
Will the light change? Will the yes, light still the change? The total light will change. The total because light we're will... blocking the light that would usually come from the star in the back. Okay. So, like, how could you define the light? The light is coming from the back or the front. It's just geometry. The, the light rays, the star is emitting light in all directions. Some of those light rays come, happen to be heading towards the Earth, and we can see them. But if there's something in the way, the light is still being emitted, but we don't see it. That's all. Okay. So if it's like if you have a, a, a spotlight, and you have another spotlight, and you move it in front of it, you won't get as much light as if both spotlights are shining on you at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Got Thank it? you. Okay. Hi, um, thank you for the talk again. I actually had a question about the book. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously exoplanets is a topic that the general public is very interested in. You know, science fiction, pop culture has imagined, you know, fantastical wor worlds for, you know, decades. So I'm just curious, like, how is the writing in your book, I guess, similar and or different from the way that you would write about the field to an audience of experts? Mm -hmm. And how did you approach writing about the technical aspects of the exoplanets field, given that your book was written for a public audience? Right. So. I mean, one way to, let me tell you what I think is different about the book compared to other books on this subject. Um, most books on this topic really focus on life, aliens. You know, what do we know about alien life elsewhere? How are we going to find it someday? I talk about that, uh, but the honest truth is we don't know very much. It is fun to talk about, to speculate about. And we have made progress towards that goal. We have some methods that we are pursuing, but we actually know very little. I want it to stay very close to the data. Like I said at the beginning, what do we know? How do we know it? And to, bring, to give you a complete briefing on where we are today. So the book really is for general audiences, but it is for the sort of audience, perhaps like you, that wants a little more detail, that is curious about the how, and the how do we know in addition to just uh, what do we know? Did that help? Yeah, OK, sure. Yeah, kind of a two part. So, protoplanetary disks, can they be small enough to have a small enough density so they won't actually form a, a sun? So, you know, then perhaps forming planets without a without a sun, as you say you see in some of these clouds. Oh, I see. Um, I have not thought about that, whether you can get a protoplanetary disk without a central object. My guess is that that wouldn't work, that the material ultimately does spiral down to the center. And, and the well, I mean, the central object up. could then be a planet if the protoplanetary disk wasn't large enough or didn't have enough mass. You mean, um, oh, the so object you know forming, the density yeah, it's a very small a protoplanetary disk. Yeah, very small cloud or, or a part of a cloud might condense and form a planetary mass object rather than a star. And, and the other that's thing, where those, those tiny objects come from I was discussing before. My understanding is that like a large number of the stars that are formed are binary systems. Yes. And so if you end up with the binary system being formed where one of them doesn't get enough mass, is that where some of these like larger scale, very fast, very small diameter um, so we, we, binary stars are very common. Most binary star, in most binary stars, the stars are so far apart that they can form planets independently of each other and probably don't affect each other. If they're really close to one another, sometimes you get a disk, and we see this actually, we see protoplanetary disks that's ex little disks that exert, exist around each star and then a disk that surrounds both of them. So you can get all three, there are three locations for planet formation in such systems. And I guess, you know, to some degree, the mass in the, that, that they do come at the expense of each other. You know, you, if you, you have a very massive circumbinary disk, there wouldn't be as much material surrounding each star. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Uh, this is an awesome talk. I'm, Thanks. It's awesome. Have all of the observations that you've talked about been from telescopes orbiting? No. Uh, we do love our space telescopes, um, but they are very, very expensive. <laughs> okay, so a lot of the work, and the early work certainly, was all based on, with telescopes on the ground. In fact, for the Doppler method, 
There are advantages of going to space, but they're not overwhelming. And so all of the Doppler work is with telescopes at mountaintop observatories. It's, it's the, the transit method that really benefits a lot from being in space. So I was told that was the last question. Nevertheless, I am happy to stick around for a little while. Um, go ahead, please. We're going to move up upstairs to the Cabot Library. We have a small refreshments and things like that and a book signing as well where you can answer all your questions. Great. Uh, so yeah. Thanks again, folks. <laughs>